So the sun shines down in a single hour, enough power to, enough power to power the world for a year. This is an absolute phenomenal amount of energy hitting us from the sun. In just one hour, we get all of our annual power needs. So to visualize that, this cube represents the sunlight hitting the Earth at 200,000 terawatts. And this is our global power demand at 20 terawatts. So you can see how much potential solar has to really provide all of our power needs. And this tiny speck here is our, our current PV solar photovoltaic installations at about 300 gigawatts. So you can see we have a long way to go to provide all of our power from solar. So we've obviously seen a huge increase in solar um, capacity in, the, in recent years. Um, there's been a, a, a growth rate of 40% since 2000 of new solar capacity each year. Um, it, just last year in the US, there was a new megawatt of solar installed coming online every 36 minutes, which is fantastic. This is phenomenal, uh, a, ph a phenomenal rate and very exciting. Uh, the, the technology we, we see on our roofs today and, and that dominate the market at about 90% are these crystalline silicon panels that you see here. These are a, a very good technology. They're very robust and they've been fine-tuned and tweaked over a 50-year learning curve. But it's unclear if this if crystalline silicon will be able to take us all the way to 100% solar penetration. And there's two reasons for that. Um, the first is that, that silicon doesn't tolerate defects very well. So tiny blemishes in the panels mean that they, they operate very poorly. So the factories have to be designed to be able to heat these panels to very, very high temperature. And this, is also, this also has very low throughput. And in, in simple terms, we just, we just can't build silicon gigafactories fast enough to be, able to, uh, to be able to power the world. So uh, as an estimate, if we had just existing factories to produce 25 panels that could produce 25 terawatts of our power, this would take us 170 years to do so. And even if, even if we used a, a more um, ambitious estimate of a, a growth rate of 20 to 30%, um, this would still take us over 40 years. So it's not clear that solar, uh, that crystalline silicon will be able to take us there. Uh, the other aspect is that there's still the element of the cost. So th this here is, is um, the cost of different parts of the solar system over the last decade in Germany. Uh, we can see that the module cost, which is the, the panel itself, uh, this has come down in price quite significantly. It's very exciting, a factor of three to four over the last decade. But then there's this, this other fraction of the cost, the bal balance of systems costs, which are all the other costs of solar, so the wiring, the installation, the inverter. And we really haven't seen much of a, of a decrease in the price of this, this component. And today, actually, 50% of the cost of a solar system is the non-module costs, all of these other costs. Uh, so I'm a physicist at Cambridge University, and I, I re lead a research group looking at new emerging photovoltaic technologies that could potentially be a lot cheaper and a lot more scalable than silicon. So in, a, in, in its simplest form, a solar cell was just and a semiconductor that can absorb light very well, sandwiched between two electrodes. So the semiconductor absorbs light, energizes electrons, and then these electrons are collected at the electrodes. And, and the two real requirements for this is that that absorber, that, sol that semiconductor absorbs the solar light very strongly, and that it's able to tra transport the charges to the electrodes very effectively. And one, one such material capable of this, which is very, very exciting, is perovskites. Uh, this is a man-made ionic mineral, uh, which is generating enormous excitement. Um, perovskites, the, uh, the, the ones we're using in solar cells, were first discovered in the 1970s. And they really lay dormant until the 90s and 2000s, when they were, they were, they were used in uh, organic transistors at IBM relatively unsuccessfully. And it wasn't until 2009 when we actually saw the first solar cell with a the perovskite. They were overlooked until then. Um, and that was operating at about 3% efficiency. And in the eight years since then, this efficiency has increased at a tremendous rate, and, and we're now at 22%. Uh, so this makes this the, the fastest improving PV technology we've ever seen. And, and to put that in context, silicon took almost 30 years to reach that 22% mark. So one of the exciting things we can do with perovskites is that we can deposit them by mixing two inexpensive and readily abundant salts to make an ink that we can print down in, in many different ways. So th this is an example of what we do in the lab. We, we drop this, this ink down onto a substrate. We spin it very fast at a few thousand RPM to form a very nice uniform film. 
and then we heat it gently to form these very dark films you can see on the right there. That, and these, uh, they're very highly crystalline. These crystals form just like salt crystals emerging from evaporating tidal pools. Uh, these films are of very high quality, and they're similar to silicon, but don't have this, this high temperature and costly processing. One of, the, uh, other, one of the other exciting things is that because we can print these down using inks, we can start printing them roll to roll like newsprint. So this is an example here. Um, this significantly reduces the module price and also the capex. And so, for example, a, a $100 million perovskite factory could do the job of a $1 billion silicon factory. And, and to run the numbers on that, um, if we could have perovskite roll to roll factories, we could power the world, make enough PV panels to power the world in just three years, which is 10 times faster than we could with silicon. So, to put that in context, less than half a cup of this ink would be enough to power an average home. And less than half an Olympic swimming pool of the ink would comfortably power all of California. Another exciting aspect is that we can make these, we can tune the components of these perovskites and make them different colors. We tune the color to, to absorb different colors of the solar spectrum, different parts of the solar spectrum. Uh, this means we can make partly transparent, opaque, and also colorful PV panels. And we can actually think about designing them into the building rather than something that we, can, we disguise. And this is the, the concept of, of building integrated photovoltaics. A particularly exciting aspect that, in my lab, we particularly look at is, is the opportunity to stack two perovskite layers together in, in what's called a tandem photovoltaic uh, solar cell architecture. So in this case, the, the top layer, they're absorbing different parts of the solar spectrum. We can actually harvest light much more efficiently by doing so. So here, the, the top cell absorbs the, the UV and the bluer light, and then the red wavelengths pass through and absorb by the lower cell. And this combination of the two together can lead to, to much higher efficiencies. So in the, in, on the right here, I show that um, if we choose the different colors of the absorber layers um, correctly, you can match them to actually get efficiencies over 32%. So this is actually real practical efficiencies with the cells that we, we're making today. Um, this is very exciting if we compare that to silicon, which is at 26%, we would have uh, quite a big paradigm shift in, uh, in, in solar. Um, of course, we've still, still, still got a lot of work to do. This, in, in the labs, we're still less than 20% with these tandem, uh, tandem solar cells, but it's, it shows huge potential. Um, another, another aspect is, with the, again, with these tandems is that instead of stacking two perovskite layers together, we could actually print down or stack a perovskite layer on top of a silicon cell. So the existing, we can actually boost the efficiency of the existing technology. Uh, this is the concept being uh, uh, investigated by Oxford Photovoltaics, a spin-out from Oxford University. And it's very likely this, this particular embodiment will be the first um, commercial product from perovskites. Um, and a, a final a very exciting aspect is that we can, we can print them down onto different substrates, and one of those could be plastics and, and flexible and lightweight substrates. And this now gives us an opportunity to, to do things that silicon couldn't do. So we can, we can produce them in rolls that we can transport in a, lot more, a lot more cheaply. Um, we could roll them out on the roof like a tarp, so installation costs come down. And these, this, this, this gives, brings a paradigm shift in, in, perovskite, in, in solar uh, deployment in that we can now start really chipping into those balance of systems costs that are very hard to do with silicon. Um, and we have some quite exciting projects along these lines that I'll happily speak more about some of those. Um, so I, I've painted a very rosy picture of, of perovskites. And, and you're, I suppose you're asking, why aren't we seeing them on roofs today? What, what's, what's stopping us from deploying them? And there's three, three main challenges. And the first is that most of the work has been done in, in academic labs, um, making prototype solar cells the size of a, of a postal stamp. And there's a, a significant engineering and scientific challenge to scale that from the, that small area up to the larger, solar cell, the larger cell area, and then, and then eventually the module area. Um, the second is that how do we make this, the solar cells last on the rooftop for 30 years? Uh, silicon sets a, a very high benchmark of 30 years. So obviously, if we want to be deploying this technology, at least in the long run, we're going to have to demonstrate that we can match that. So there's a lot of work going on in testing these solar cells, testing these perovskite solar cells under uh, strenuous accelerated lifetime testing, elevated temperatures, temperature cycling, um, and high humidity to really simulate 
a 30 year life, life, um, lifespan. Uh, this is, these are some results, some recent results from EP EPFL and Luzan. Uh, they're very, very encouraging. Uh, this is showing a continual operation of the solar cell for 1,000 hours at elevated temperature, which is, um, which is a very exciting result. Uh, and the third point is, is what my, we look at, particularly in my lab, is how, how can we take the efficiencies of these perovskite solar cells to their limits? Uh, I mentioned that these, these tandem cells are still below 20%. We need to be able to push them beyond silicon into 30%. Uh, so there needs to be a lot of effort in that. So in my lab, we, we look at how we, we use lasers to look at how light interacts with these perovskites, these, these materials, how it creates energized electrons, and how we can collect those electro energized electrons. Uh, so we look at length, uh, time scales of a, of a billionth of a second and length scales one hundredth the width of a human hair. So just, uh, just for a couple of examples of what we do, so here we, 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 po we provide a pulse of light on the solar cell, create creating a load of energized electrons, and then we look at how those energized electrons lose their energy over time, um, over time scales of femtoseconds and picoseconds and nanoseconds. So very, very fast time scales. And we can also work out how far they travel during this time. Um, and it turns out that these charges can travel very, very far in perovskites, many, many tens of micrometers. This, this doesn't sound like much, but the, the solar cell itself is, is only half a micron thick. It's absorbing a lot of light in that very, very thin uh, layer, so it means we can easily collect those ele electrons at the electrodes, and we can have very simple sandwich architectures. Um, this is much longer than uh, other emerging PV technologies, which generally require more complicated electrode structures to collect these uh, electrons. Uh, another aspect we look at is the luminescence of these solar cells. So it's, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but actually a solar cell, to, to have a very efficient solar cell, we actually want it to be as luminescent as possible. So that when we shine light on it, we want at least some light coming back out. So this is a, this is a luminescence map zooming into these small cr perovskite crystals. And we can see that some of the grains are very, very dark. Some of these crystals are very dark. They have lots of defects, and that, that leads to a power loss in the solar cell. Some of the grains are very, very bright, and they're, and they're very efficient. So the, o the aim is to, to make a very uniform luminescence image. So we, we do a lot of work looking at how we can passivate these defects, how could we heal these defects. And this is an, a recent example of, of, of looking at treatments where we can actually soak them for short periods in humidity, oxygen, and with light. And we actually can curiously actually heal these defects. And you can see the before and after that we've, we've brightened a lot of these grains. And this leads to a, a, an improved efficiency in the solar cell. So I've, I've been talking about luminescence, and of course, um, we're also looking at perovskites for light emission applications, so lasers and LEDs as well. Um, so just like we can, we can change the absorber layer, the absorber color, we can also change the emission color. And we can have very, very high color purity and tune that color right across the visible spectrum. These are some ink inks that are different colors, and, and you can see the different emission colors. Um, and this means we can combine them in different ways to make for example, very high quality and tunable white light. Um, so for example, we can make white light that could suit any consumer market, for example, warmer white light or cooler white light, just by changing the, the emitters or the color components on the production line. And this opens up a whole new range of, of very low cost and very high quality white light applications. Um, we can also make very high resolution displays, um, such as the one you can see here, um, which, which could be also with, have flexible form factors, just like the solar cells. So perovskites really have, give us the opportunity to be, able to, uh, to be able to really change how we consume and how we produce energy through, through low-cost photovoltaics and, and light emission applications. Um, we've still got a long way to go, of course, and I outlined some of those challenges, but I think the wait will be well worth it. Um, a perovskite future could well be a very bright future. Thank you. <laughs>